What's up guys, it's DDP, back again to address an apparent controversy between Chandler Parsons and Harrison Barnes. Who was the bigger Mavericks free agent signing? Well, before we get to all that, I actually wanted to address something here. As you may know on the TV, Chia, the Dallas Prospect has a new logo, and oh, check this out, new merch! All of that's coming on sale soon. If you guys are interested in t-shirts or other merchandise, either drop me a message or drop me a comment below and uh, we'll get that set up for you. Now in the video last week in which I was actually talking about do you take Michael Porter Jr. or Mo Bamba with the fifth overall pick in the draft, I tried to build a little bit of context around the recent history of the Dallas Mavericks. Since that time, the best free agent acquisition the Mavericks have gotten would probably be Chandler Parsons, who they had to overpay to keep Houston from matching. Along the way, I made reference to the fact that the Mavericks haven't really been relevant since that 2011 title, which apparently was a controversial statement in itself, but I would argue how many times have they won a playoff series? Hell, how many playoff games have they won since then? The answer is zero playoff series, and total playoff games we're probably talking six? I, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good at all. So, that's that. But the bigger controversy, apparently, was my addressing of Harrison Barnes not being the biggest free agent signing for the Mavericks since the title. Now, I actually have reasoning behind why I said it, but because it was kind of a throwaway context builder at the time, I didn't feel the need to really elaborate on it. And as such, I wanted to do this video today so that we could actually get to the root of the debate and why I said Chandler Parsons was the bigger free agent signing. To be clear, this is not about who has had the better tenure as a Dallas Maverick. Parsons had two years, Barnes has had two years. Parsons got hurt two years, Barnes has not yet gotten hurt. So the obvious weight says that Barnes has already had a better career as a Maverick, especially because he's been able to elevate to number one option in the offense. Granted, that's assisted by the fact that Dirk has been declining into his golden years. But nevertheless, he has been able to take that next step and be the go-to guy, whereas Parsons never did in Dallas. That alone puts him ahead of Parsons. But that's not the context in which I was referring. If we were going off of context of simply who was better on the court, I would have listed Vince Carter before I listed Chandler Parsons. So allow me today to elaborate a little bit on why I think Chandler Parsons is the biggest Maverick signing since the title. First, however, I want to address Harrison Barnes' tenure with the Dallas Mavericks. Harrison Barnes came to Dallas following the 2016 season, a season in which Dallas once again got easily knocked out of the playoffs in the first round, losing in five games to the Oklahoma City Thunder, and in which Harrison Barnes' Warriors blew a 3-1 lead in the NBA Finals to LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, Harrison Barnes was a solid player for Golden State, but he was clearly the fourth option on that team. And with him coming up on free agency, and the Warriors shocking the NBA world by acquiring Kevin Durant, there was simply no room for him on the roster. Now here's where context really plays in here. Kevin Durant announced his decision to leave Oklahoma City for Golden State on July 4th, 2016. This was well into free agency in which all these other teams had already thrown money left and right at free agents. There wasn't a huge market for Harrison Barnes as far as getting a max deal. As a result, Dallas fell perfectly into place as his suitable target. Now this is also interesting to note because the Mavericks really hadn't made a peep in free agency that summer. We've seen year after year how the Mavericks would chase the big fish in hopes of landing a premier free agent after the title. And with the exception of the year before, they really never even got close. So 2016, when they're not making a peep, it looks damn bad for the Mavericks as far as the future. This is where luck happened to be on the Mavericks' side. Because there wasn't much market for Harrison Barnes, and because Dallas was at least close enough removed from their NBA championship, they were able to land him for four years and $94 million. Now again, that's a lot of money, nearly $100 million to a guy that was clearly the fourth option on his own team, 
and a guy who, during that 3-1 blown lead in the finals, was abysmal shooting the ball. His, his decline in that finals alone was a big part of why Golden State collapsed. So his stock was low, and the move was not seen as a splash move by anybody in the NBA. Now to Barnes' credit, the moment he stepped off the plane, he embraced the city of Dallas and started working to become a foundational piece for the next competitive Dallas team. In doing so, he would eventually elevate to the number one option in the offense. On that front alone, he achieved something Chandler Parsons never did. The unfortunate thing for Barnes is that he arrived in Dallas when the team still wasn't acknowledging it needed to rebuild, but it was painfully obvious to anyone in the fan base. Because of that, he has been with Dallas two seasons, and Dallas has missed the playoffs in both seasons, with last season's team being the third worst record in the Western Conference. Now that's not a knock on Harrison Barnes, that simple context around his situation when weighing free agency between him and Parsons. Given his age of 26 years old, it's still possible that Harrison Barnes could factor into the Mavericks' next competitive run. With Dennis Smith Jr. and Harrison Barnes, if Dallas can get a young, talented player, whether that be a Mo Bamba or a Michael Porter Jr. or a Luka Doncic or someone to that effect, or hell, watch my other video, some combination of two of those guys by swinging that Memphis deal, there's a significant chance that he could factor in. He's still young enough, but I think the financials of it could become a little bit of a problem and whether he's a true number one on the team or if he would be willing to step back into that two or three option role, we'll see. That's all speculation there. All the same, that's how things were when he came into Dallas and where we were at. So although he has panned out as better than Parsons, he didn't come in with better circumstances or more expectation than Chandler Parsons. So now on to the guy I did mention. Chandler Parsons, as a restricted free agent, was signed away by the Dallas Mavericks after the 2014 season. In the previous offseason, he had been named as a significant part of what brought Dwight Howard to Houston. So his recruiting acumen was already highly thought of at that point. So Dallas, in signing him, not only looked at him and said, this guy was a very good number two option on a good Houston team alongside James Harden, but because of his age at the time, which I think was like 24, 25 years old, there was still a lot of belief that he could continue to ascend and get better as a player. Add in his recruiting abilities and Dallas's just obsession with landing a big fish and it made total sense. He came in with high expectations to become that second option to Dirk, possible successor, although I never really bought into that aspect of it, but the idea was he could be a significant foundational piece. Dallas already had Dirk, who was still playing at a high level, Monte Ellis, who the season before was fantastic for Dallas, added in Chandler Parsons, and then, before the draft that year, reacquired Tyson Chandler. And it brought in Raymond Felton, who would later become a good player for the Mavericks. But it brought in those guys. Dallas had an electric offense that season. One of the best offenses in the league, and they were lethal in the pick and roll. What they didn't have was a lot of defense or a point guard. You remember Jameer Nelson? That's what they were working with. As a result of that, Dallas couldn't really rise up in the standings like they had expected they could. And as a result, at the trade deadline, they made a very ballsy move to try and address that by trading for Rajon fucking Rondo. Now at the time, I myself and most Mavs fans thought this was a stroke of genius. You get a better defensive point guard, a floor general, and a guy who comes up clutch in the playoffs. It made sense until you really thought about it and realized, hey, both him and Monte Ellis have to have the ball in their hands a lot, and they're not really good off the ball at all. Neither of them can shoot the ball very well from deep, so all the floor spacing that had made Dallas's three-point shooting that season just lights out good suddenly went away. Now, 
whether or not Dallas would have made a better showing in the playoffs had they not made the Rajon Rondo deal, I don't know. But the second Rondo got there, he killed whatever chemistry the team had, became cancerous. We know the fallout and drama with Rick Carlisle, which ended in Rajon Rondo being sent home during the playoffs with a back injury. <laughs> and for extra context, Chandler Parsons only played one game, I think it was, in that playoff series versus Houston before leaving in need of knee surgery. But regardless, when the Mavericks made this move, they thought this was their team of the future. A starting lineup of Rajon Rondo, Monte Ellis, Chandler Parsons, Dirk Nowitzki, and Tyson Chandler. That is a nice, nice starting lineup on paper. Notice what I say there, on paper. We saw how it played out. But when they made the move, Mark Cuban and Donnie Nelson felt this was their core for the future. That did not work out, unfortunately. But you also look at some of those bench players. Raymond Felton, who was actually pretty good for the Mavericks, still around in the league, even has had some nice moments with the Clippers and with uh, Thunder recently. Al Farouk Amino, dude really showed up that year, was good for them. I think one more year, or maybe he left that summer. Regardless, it was a nice player for Dallas when he was here. That summer, Chandler Parsons, Mark Cuban, Donnie Nelson, and a slew of other Mavs recruiters met with free agent, big man from the Los Angeles Clippers, DeAndre Jordan. The pitch would be that Jordan, whereas he was a third or fourth guy in LA, would be the face of the future for the Mavericks. He would be the central building block for the future of that team. Now, Tyson, I love Tyson, and I hated that they did that to him a second time, but DeAndre Jordan had the same numbers, was younger and just theoretically going into his prime, and Tyson was getting up there in age. So it wasn't a bad move necessarily to go after DeAndre Jordan. In addition to DeAndre Jordan, Parsons also recruited and actually did get Wesley Matthews for the Mavericks from the Portland Trail Blazers as well. Now, it was supposed to be a package deal. Wes and DeAndre Jordan joining Chandler Parsons to be the three-headed monster of the future for the Dallas Mavericks. How did that work out? Well, we had the Great Emoji War of 2015. See, DeAndre Jordan gave a verbal commitment to the Dallas Mavericks but he couldn't actually sign his deal for a week just because of how the NBA free agency rules are set up. As a result, he started to get cold feet and this culminated in him being effectively barricaded in his Houston home alongside teammates Chris Paul, Paul Pierce, Blake Griffin, JJ Redick, uh, head coach Doc Rivers, and I wanna say the new Clippers owner as well, all barricading themselves in his house, basically having an all-night hangout session to get him to change his mind, while Cuban and Parsons desperately tried to get a hold of DeAndre Jordan. In the end, Jordan reneged on his verbal commitment, re-signed with the Clippers for a max deal, and now of that group, he's the only one left in LA. Funny how that works. Karma. But hey, to his credit, Wes Matthews was given an out to also back out of the deal if he wanted, but he kept his commitment to Dallas, and for that, you have to respect him. The following summer, Chandler Parsons would once again miss the playoffs because he would have to undergo surgery on the same knee, thus ending his tenure with the Dallas Mavericks. Ready for a fresh change and with the Mavericks not willing to commit additional money to him despite him opting out of his final year, Chandler Parsons instead left for the Memphis Grizzlies on a four-year $94 million. That is the same contract we gave Harrison Barnes. Look how much better that one aged. So yes, when Chandler Parsons came to Dallas, not only was he believed to be a significant building block of the future, he was also believed to be a significant recruiter who could bring Dallas one or more big fish, and his tenure in Dallas came during a time in which the Mavericks looked on paper and probably were closer than we realized to being a real contender. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for him, but that's not to say that at the time of his signing, he wasn't a significant addition. But when it comes to on the court success, it's not even close, man. Give me Harrison Barnes all day. So what do you think, guys? Do you agree? 
Comment below and let me know. Either tell me, hey, that makes total sense, or hey, you're an idiot, because I hear that plenty. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I've been DDP with the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, salute.